Hello everybody and welcome to Storytime. My name is Mackenzie Borkovich and today we will be reading a series of holiday books. First up is Olivia Helps with Christmas, written and illustrated by Ian Falconer. Twas the day before Christmas, Olivia and her family had been out all morning, busy with last minute shopping. Olivia was exhausted, yet there was still so much to do. Olivia told her father and Ian to put up the tree, so she could help her mother with William's lunch. Olivia, what are you feeding him? Blueberry pie. Oh, darling, that's going to make him sick. Whoops. By four o'clock, Olivia was getting impatient. Sweetheart, Santa won't be here for hours, said her mother. Now, wipe that soot off your snout and help me untangle these lights. Mommy... Darling, it's much easier if you plug them in first. There, isn't that better? Finally, the tree was trimmed. 5 o'clock p.m. Santa watch. No Santa. Rain. Olivia wanted to be even more of a help. Mommy, may I set the table for Christmas Eve dinner? Oh yes, Olivia. That would be very helpful. Why, that's beautiful, darling. Where did you ever find that perfect little... Tree? Would you like to help me build a fire, Olivia? Daddy... What could you be thinking? Do you want to cook Santa? 7 o'clock p.m. Santa watch. No Santa. But no rain. After dinner, the family gathered to sing carols. Softly, they started. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. Olivia always lets go for the chorus. Gloria. Finally, the most important task of the night, leaving treats for Santa Claus. Olivia said, now it's time to wait. Her mother said, now it's time for bed. But Olivia wasn't at all sleepy. She tossed and she turned. First she was hot, then she was cold, then she heard something on the roof. Could it be Santa? It seemed she would never go to sleep until she woke up and saw it was morning. Olivia ran to get her brothers. Noiselessly, they crept down the stairs. Snow, presents, stockings, and look, cried Olivia. Santa ate all the cookies and milk. Now, children, said Olivia's mother, finish your breakfast, and then you can open your presents under the tree. It looks like someone just learned to walk. Some of Santa's offerings were better than others. Pajamas, skis, sweater, sled, booties, maracas. The children thanked their parents for a wonderful Christmas, and Olivia announced, now I have a present for you. It's a self-portrait. Won't it be beautiful over the fireplace? Well, said Olivia, I think it'll hit the slopes. Skiing takes more practice. Olivia and Ian worked all afternoon to make a snowman. Olivia dressed it. That evening, Olivia finally allowed her father to build a fire. The family sat and warmed their trotters, while Olivia's mother brought them steaming mugs of hot soup. Soon it was time for bed, but Olivia wasn't at all sleepy, or so she said. But before the lights were even out, she fell into a deep, dreamless slumber. Well, not quite dreamless. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'll be reading Hanukkah Mice that was written by Stephen Crawl and the illustrations are by Michelle Shapiro. It's about a little girl who, instead of asking for things for herself for Hanukkah, gives a family of mice their own Hanukkah celebration. It was the first night of Hanukkah. The mouse family scampered out of their mouse hole and up the basement stairs. They watched Mr. Silman one of the big people lift the shamus candle, say the prayers, and light the first Hanukkah candle. Now it's time for Rachel to open her first Hanukkah gift, he said. Rachel couldn't wait. She unwrapped the big box in the middle of the living room. She gasped at what she saw, an exquisitely carved dollhouse with a porch and white trim that wrapped around the outside like the frosting on a wedding cake. Each window had a set of tiny lace curtains in it. It's beautiful, Rachel said. May I play with it now? Not until after dinner, said Mrs. Silman. Mindy Mouse tugged her little brother's tail. Mitchell, it's just the right size for us, she whispered. Yeah, you're right, said Mitchell. The Mouse family watched the Silmans eat their holiday supper. They watched Rachel play with the dollhouse after dessert. They scurried behind Mr. Silman as he carried the dollhouse to Rachel's room. They watched as Rachel finally fell asleep. 
Then, Mindy poked Mitchell. Come on, let's explore. Shh, said Mama. Hurry, said Papa. The mice skittered inside the dollhouse. This place would be really cool if it had some furniture, said Mitchell. Look at me, I can do somersaults, said Mindy. On the second night of Hanukkah, the mouse family watched Mr. Silman light the second candle. Rachel opened another Hanukkah gift. It was a miniature wing-back chair with a little matching stool. Just right for tiny feet, said Rachel. When the mouse family visited the dollhouse later that night, the wing chair was sitting in the living room. Papa settled in it with a smile. On the third night, Rachel's gift was a little sofa. She laughed, just right for a tiny family. And sure enough, later that night, the mouse family found it next to the wingback chair. Look at me, said Mindy, bouncing up and down on the cushions as Mitchell threw a pillow at her. On the fourth night, Rachel got a set of little plates, just right for tiny lockies, she said. When the mouse family saw the plates later, they had tiny lockies with applesauce on them. Yum, said Mitchell. I wonder where those lockies come from, Mama said. On the fifth night, there was a bureau in the bedroom with some Hanukkah gelt. And on the sixth night, two beds appeared, each with a dreidel on the pillow. Hey, said Mindy, giving one a spin. Wow, said Mitchell, spinning the other. I wonder where all this came from, said Mama. Then, on night number seven, Rachel's gift was a table and chairs. The mouse family found them right in the middle of the dollhouse dining room. The table was covered with a special Hanukkah cloth. I wonder where the tablecloth came from, said Mama. Our very own menorah for our very own Hanukkah, said Papa, and so much wonderful food. He lit all eight electric candles and said the prayers. Happy Hanukkah, said Mindy and Mitchell. Happy Hanukkah, said Papa. I wonder where all this came from, said Mama. And from under the covers, Rachel smiled. Hello, my name is Ellie Waters, and today I will be reading to you the story of Babushka, a Christmas tale. It was written by Don Casey and illustrated by Amanda Hall. Long ago and far away, there lived a little old woman called Babushka. Babushka was always busy. She was forever scrubbing and sweeping and washing and wiping and dusting and polishing. Her little house was neat as a pen. One winter's evening, when the snow lay thick upon the ground, the clouds parted and a bright star shone. Inside, Babushka was busy polishing. She saw only the dirt and smudges on her candlesticks. Outside, there came to the sound of voice calls, whispers, gasps of delight. Inside, Babushka was busy sweeping. She heard only the swish swish of her own broom. Knock, knock, knock. Even Babushka couldn't miss that. There in the doorway stood three men, richly dressed in silk and velvet. May we come in and rest a while? asked the travelers. We have journeyed far, and we are cold and hungry. Come in, come in, said Babushka. Come warm yourselves by the fire. Only please do wipe your feet. While the travelers rested, Babushka bustled about. She peeled and chopped and stirred. She cooked up a great pot of steaming soup. And as they ate, they talked. Where are you going? Babushka asked. We saw a star shining in the east. We are following the star to the place where the babe is born. A newborn child. Babushka was quiet then, thinking of her own children, all grown and gone, and of her grandchildren who lived so far away. Who is the child? Babushka asked. A newborn king, the prince of peace, the light of love. When the travelers were warm and well fed, they began pulling on their boots. We must go now, Babushka, they said, to take gifts to the child. Come, come with us. What? said Babushka without washing the dishes. So the travelers thanked Babushka for her kindness and rode out into the night. And Babushka stayed at home. Babushka swept up the breadcrumbs and wiped up the soup spills. She washed the dishes and she went to bed. That night, Babushka had a dream. She dreamed of soft hay and a gentle breath and mother's warm arms and a quiet smile. She dreamed of a baby with eyes dark and bright as a starry night. Babushka woke to see starlight streaming through her window. And pulling her shawl around her shoulders, she went out into the silent night. There was a star, shining. Babushka looked up at the star. The star looked down at Babushka. Then her cat came and wound itself around her boots. 
Babushka realized how cold her toes were, and she came back inside. I will go and find the child, she said to herself, and I will bring him gifts tomorrow. And in the morning, she opened an old chest. It was full of toys. Babushka had made them all, for she loved to work with her hands. There were toys of wood, carved and painted bright, toys of wool, knitted and stitched and sewn. They had never been played with. Babushka filled her baskets with gifts and good things to eat. Rosy apples, sweet nuts, and spicy gingerbread. And pulling her shawl close around her shoulders, she set off into the morning framed with frost. Babushka looked down for the footsteps of the travelers, but the snow had covered their tracks. Babushka looked up for the star to guide her, but the morning sky was empty. Babushka stood all alone in the cold. She didn't know which way to go. But for the first time in a long time, Babushka wasn't busy. She wasn't bustling. She was simply still. So she heard the sound of someone else nearby. At the edge of the forest, a girl was out gathering firewood. She was wearing such a thin dress. She was shivering with cold. Here, my child, said Babushka. And she took from her basket a warm knitted shawl and wrapped it around the girl's shoulders. The girl flung her arms around Babushka and hugged her tight. Babushka laughed, and even though her toes were cold, she felt warm inside. Babushka walked and walked. She walked until the sun set behind the winter trees. She walked until the moon rose above the silver birches. At the frozen river, by a hole in the ice, a boy was packing away his fishing net. Babushka smiled. Catch anything? The boy shook his head. And Babushka heard his tummy grumble. Here, my child, said Babushka, and she took from her basket a thick slice of gingerbread. The boy bent to the gingerbread, and his eyes shone. Babushka walked and walked. She met girls and boys with no toys to play with. So she took from her basket a doll, a whistle, a ball. Babushka kept on walking and walking, and found children all over the land. Babushka is still journeying, and everywhere she goes, she gives a gift. Her basket is full, and her heart is light. Her heart is shining with the light of love, like a bright star in the midwinter. The end. Hi, I'm Amanda, and I'm going to be reading A Loud Winter's Nap, which was written and illustrated by Katie Hudson. This book was also published by Picture Window Books. Tortoise had just snuggled in for his long winter nap when, Hello there, Tortoise, chirped Robin. Would you like to join our singing class? No, grumbled Tortoise. I was trying to sleep. Tortoises don't like winter. Why not, chirped Robin. They just don't, said Tortoise, and he packed up and left in search of a quieter home. Tortoise snuggled down in his new bed. He was just about to close his eyes when, Hi, a Tortoise. Would you like to make some ice sculptures with me? Asked Rabbit. No, groaned Tortoise. I was trying to sleep. Tortoises don't like winter. Why not, asked Rabbit. They just don't, said Tortoise, and he packed up again. Tortoise trudged through the snow and found a new napping spot. Again, Tortoise snuggled down in his new bed. He was just about to close his eyes when, Hey, Tortoise, would you like to play in our snowball fight? Asked Squirrel. No, Tortoise said angrily. I'm trying to sleep. Tortoises don't like winter. Why not, asked Squirrel. They just don't, groaned Tortoise. Why would anyone want to stay awake for winter? Grumbled Tortoise. He was tired and cold and needed to find a quieter place to sleep. Tortoise decided to move to higher ground. Again, Tortoise snuggled down in his new bed. He was just about to close his eyes when, Oh no, cried Tortoise. I do not like winter, Tortoise said. Tortoise hiked up a big snowy hill. Behind a small tree, Tortoise found a flat piece of wood. It was the perfect place for napping. He snuggled down in his new bed and was about to close his eyes when, whoosh. As Tortoise whizzed along, he couldn't help smiling. Maybe winter isn't so bad, he thought. And as he flew off his sled and through the air, he couldn't help giggling. Maybe winter is more than cold and snow, he thought. And as he slid across the ice, he realized he had been wrong. That night, Tortoise skated, slid, and spun with his friends late into the night. He wasn't tired or cold. Maybe some tortoises could like winter after all. Hi, I'm Kaylee, and I'll be reading La Noche Buena, A Christmas Story. 
by Antonio Saker. It was also illustrated by Angela Dominguez. I hope you enjoy and take us in Spanish along the way. When I arrive at my abuela Mimi's house, it is hot. Too hot for making snowmen, too hot for ice skating, too hot for evergreens. My abuela, my grandmother, lives in a neighborhood called Little Havana in Miami, Florida. Palm trees sway overhead. How will Santa land his sleigh in this heat? As much as I love my Cuban grandmother and as many times as she tells me I'm her favorite nieta, granddaughter, I'd rather be up north for Christmas with my mother, my other grandmother, all my up north cousins, and snow. Lots and lots of snow. It's my dad's turn to have me, and he wants me to see how the Cuban side of my family celebrates the holidays. He says, La Noche Buena, Christmas Eve, is the best night of the year in many Cuban homes. But he won't even be here. He has to work out of town and will come back on Christmas Day. Mimi tells me the preparations start tomorrow, and she needs my help. She speaks in Spanish because she is too old to learn English. That's what she tells me. She says that I'm young enough to speak both. She tucks me into bed. Her wrinkly cheek feels soft on my chin. The next morning, she wakes me and brings me into the kitchen. It is full of women. My aunts and girl cousins stand at the long counter and everybody works. They peel onions, they chop onions, and they cry. They teach me how to peel the onions. I cry, they laugh. They sort beans, they peel and chop garlic. Their fingers move so fast, I can barely see what they do. They teach me how to peel garlic. I get little dedos of garlic everywhere. They laugh. Mimi whirls around and between us, gathering ingredients and tossing them in a large cast iron pot. She adds olive oil and sour orange peels and cumin and oregano, and then stirs it all up with a long wooden spoon. Mimi dips her pinky into the pot. The women stop chopping and cutting and laughing, hold their breath, and watch her. She pulls out her finger, covered with spicy oil. She smells it, dabs it on her tongue, and smiles. They all exhale and let out a huge laugh. She pours the liquid from the pot into a large glass jar. Nina, mijita, the first batch is ready. Take this jar of marinade to your Uncle Tito's house. Where does he live? I reply in Spanish. Just walk out the front door and open your ears. She hands me the heavy jar, kisses me on the cheek, and pushes me out of the kitchen. I walk out the front door. I listen. At first, I only hear the cars going by on Calle Ocho. Then I hear a dog barking and loud burps above me. I look toward the sound and see colorful parrots. Then I hear shouting and laughing. I walk down the street toward the sound, struggling with the jar. The sun is rising and it feels hotter than yesterday. I see my uncle in the backyard of a house. All my uncles and boy cousins are there. They stand around a huge pit in the ground with a massive fire at the bottom that is burning high into the sky. A few other men gather at a large bathtub back by the fence. Vino Nina, mi sobrina, ven acá. Uncle Tito calls me over to him. He takes a jar from my hands, sets it on the ground, lifts me in the air, and twirls me around and around. He smells like cigar smoke and campfire and his bristly chin tickles my cheek. Nina, you got tall. You'll be taller than me soon. I don't believe him because he's really tall, but it makes me happy. The men take the marinade. One of them carefully pours it into the bathtub in the backyard. Uncle Tito takes two thick wooden sticks and pushes them deep in the ground on either side of the pit. What are you doing, I ask. Well, Nina, I'm making a spit to hold the pig we will roast over the next three days for the Noche Buena meal. Hand me that pole. I help my cousin Papito carry a long pole over towards Uncle Tito. He holds it over the two wooden sticks and carefully lowers it into the notches. It fits perfectly. All the men cheer. Why are they cheering? I ask Papito. He's my age, but I am taller than he is. He's the first one to get the pole into the notches and not drop it into the fire, Papito replies. Vaya, niña, says Uncle Tito. We need more of Mimi's marinade, and you are the only one who can go. Mimi won't let any of us men into the kitchen, and we won't let any of the women by the fire. They need you in the kitchen, but we need you here, too. You will have to go back and forth many times over the next few days. He's right. For the next three days. I peel onions and garlic in the kitchen. My aunts and abuela chop them up and I listen to them tell stories about Cuba. I bring countless jars of marinade to the men who pour it over the roasting pig 
and I listen to them talk about American football. All over the neighborhood, other families do the same. On the street between the houses, I meet other boys and girls my age carrying marinade to their uncles. We smell like campfire and garlic. We taste one another's marinades by dipping our little pinkies into the jars and dabbing them on our tongues. We tell stories about our families and laugh so hard. We promise to visit each other during La Noche Buena. Finally, La Noche Buena arrives. Feast time! I help my abuela set up a table outside as the sun sets and turns the clouds red and orange. Then we change our clothes. I wear a brand new dress that Mimi gives me. She tells me I look lovely. I tell her that she looks beautiful. Then everyone comes. All my aunts wearing colorful dresses and my uncles dressed in brand new Gaja Bear shirts with their shoes sparkling. With them come my cousins, also dressed in their best. Mimi sends me and Papito out to gather fruit from the trees in the neighborhood. We pluck limes for the meat, lemons for the water, avocados for the salad, and mangoes for dessert, all right from the trees to the table. When we get back to the table, it is covered with mounds of food, with the roasted pig in the center. Everybody yells and laughs, and then we all sit down to the feast. I want to eat right away, but Papito whispers, we have to wait for the toast. The toasts begin, with the best storytellers in the family giving thanks for a great year. Then Mimi, at the head of the table, holds her glass in the air, and the table falls silent. Her big brown eyes glisten as she says, let us give thanks to all those here and those who are not here. We are happy to be alive and we miss those who are dead, and we are happy that Jesus will be born soon. We are grateful for the pig and this family and the table and the laughter. We are thankful for the laughter. And then I finally get to eat. It's the most magnificent meal I have ever eaten. I eat plate after plate. Then the neighbors come by and Mimi feeds them. Afterward, we go to their house and they feed us. It's a huge traveling party, eaten in many different backyards for many hours. I've never ever eaten so much or so well. Finally, the food is put away and we all go to the Misa del Gallo, the rooster's nest at midnight, where I walk around the church to hug every single member of the congregation, just like everyone else does. By the time we all get back to the house, I'm so happy and so tired. Then, Uncle Tito turned on the old record player and grabs my hands and everyone starts dancing. The music barely stops, but when it does, my aunts and uncles tell more stories and jokes, and as the sun rises on Christmas Day, after La Noche Buena, the good night, everybody finally goes home, tired but happy. As my abuela tucks me into bed, I ask her, may I come next year and can I bring all my up north cousins? She smiles and says, mijita. Nothing would make me happier. My dad is right. This is the best night of the year, and I can't wait to tell him so. Y colorín colorado, este cuento se ha acabado. The end. Hi guys, my name is Melina, and today I'm going to be reading Tree of Cranes for you. This book was written by Alan Say, illustrated by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and published by HMH Books for Young Readers. When I was not yet old enough to wear long pants, Mama always worried that I might drown in a neighbor's pond. Time and again, she warned me not to play there, but I never listened because the pond was filled with carp of bright colors. The last time I went there was a gray winter day, too cold for the fish to move around. They never came out from under the rocks and all I caught was a bad chill. Mama would be upset with me, I knew, she would know right away how I got my mittens all wet, but then she might be happy just to see me. Mama, I'm home, I called. There was no answer. She always met me at the porch, always. I called again and finally she answered, sounding far away. I waited, but she didn't come out to see me. She must be sick, I thought. Mama was in the living room, folding origami paper. She just nodded, barely looking at me. But there were two slices of my favorite tea cake waiting for me. That made me feel better. Why are you making cranes? I asked. Because I want to make a big wish, she said, without looking up. You're going to fold a thousand cranes to make your wish come true? 
maybe even 2,000. She reached out and touched my face with her cool hand. Why, you're hot all over, Mama frowned and gave me a silent stare. I hung my head and said nothing, she knew. Anytime Mama thought I had a cold, it was time for a hot bath. Ten whole minutes and not one second less, she told me. She was upset. She didn't even rinse my back. Her slippers were shuffling all the way down the hallway. Then a door closed shut. She wasn't coming back to keep me company. I'd better say I'm sorry, I thought to myself. But before I could apologize, Mama put me in my night clothes. I don't want to go to bed. You need to stay nice and warm. All afternoon? All afternoon. Will you read me stories? No stories, but I'll make you hot lunch. I knew what that meant. Rice gruel. Only sick people eat rice gruel. And that's what I had, with a sour plum and yellow radishes, eating all alone and drinking hot tea in Papa's big cup. Then I lay down facing the door and hoped and hoped Mama would come back with an apple and peel the skin in a long strip like a red ribbon and then read me a story. The door never opened. Mama, I called finally. She didn't answer. After a long while, I heard a noise coming from the garden. Maybe the old gardener had come to clip our trees again. I got up and opened the window. It was snowing outside and Mama was digging around a small tree. What are you doing? I shouted. Mama stopped and stared. Close that window this second and go straight back to bed. Quickly, I closed the window and lay down again. She's really angry now, I thought. But why is she gardening in the snow? Is she digging a hole because she's angry with me? I didn't know what to think. I was nearly asleep when Mama came in. She was carrying a tree in a blue pot. It was a little pine Mama and Papa had planted when I was born, so I would live a long life like the tree. What are you doing with my tree? I asked. You'll see, she said, setting down the pot. Do you know what today is? Ah, seven days before the New Year's Day. That's right, she said and smiled. Then she fetched the silver cranes and some sewing things from the living room. Finally, Mama sat down. She put a thread through one of the cranes and hung it from the tree. I have been acting strangely all day, she said. I started to reply, but she shushed me. If you promise to stay in bed, I will tell you why. I promise, I said. I was born and lived far away in another country, long before I came here and met your father. Where? A warm place called California, she whispered. I nodded. Today is a very special day in that warm place. If you happen to be there now, you would see trees like this everywhere, all decorated with twinkling lights in small globes of silver and gold. And under each tree, there are boxes of presents people give to friends and loved ones. I want a samurai kite, I said. You give and receive, child. It is a day of love and peace. Strangers smile at one another. Enemies stop fighting. We need more days like it. She put the last crane on the tree. It's wonderful, I cried. It's not finished, she said, and she brought some candles from the kitchen and tied them to the branches. Are you going to burn my tree? I asked. Mama laughed. Just the candles and only for a short while. We'll replant your tree tomorrow. I want to light them. May I? May I? Do it quickly then. Mama let me strike the matches, and when all the candles were lit, she fell silent. She was remembering. She was seeing another tree in a faraway place where she had been small like me. Mama held me in her lap. The cranes turned slowly, flashing candlelight. There couldn't be a tree more beautiful than mine, I thought, not even in the place where Mama was born. What present would you like? I asked. Only peace and quiet, Mama said. I mean something for me. Oh, something very, very special, like a promise. I said I would stay in bed. Another promise, then. All right, give me your word you'll never go to the pond again. I promised. I was fast asleep when Papa came home. Next morning, I jumped out of bed because the fierce warrior was staring at me. But it was only a kite, only a kite, the one I'd always wanted. Then I saw the tree behind it, my tree. 
Suddenly I remembered last night and all that Mama had told me. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, Papa. I ran outside with my present. Outside, everything was covered with snow. There will be another day, Mama said. A fine, windy day with no snow. Plenty of snow to make a snowman, Papa said. Let's make one together. And like the snowman we made, many years have melted away now. But I will always remember... That day of peace and quiet, it was my first Christmas. A special thank you goes out to the Sharpsburg Community Library and our high school librarian, Dr. Laura Ward, for allowing us to borrow the books we shared with you today. And don't forget to watch the 2020 Telethon this Wednesday at 11 a.m. on the Swiftbox Media YouTube channel.